Thanks, Kristen, for inviting me. I'm excited to share with you guys about this research, um, sorry, this um, resource that we've compiled um, with the Center for Plant Conservation and our colleagues at our home institution, the San Diego Zoo. Uh, did I press, did I press the middle button? Press the arrow. Not arrow. Oh. Great. Great start to talk about technology. Um, <laughs> So I don't think I have to convince you all, but pollinators are very important to rare plant conservation, and this can um, happen very directly if a plant has specialized pollinators and loses um, its primary mode of reproduction, as um, the famous case of Brachymnia in Cygnus in Hawaii has happened, where now that plant can only be um, propagated by hand pollination by humans after the loss of its native pollinator. And also um, the more um, indirect effect of community-wide pollinator loss on um, already um, dwindling plant populations. And so um, in order to make informed and strategic um, choices about plant conservation, we need to document these plant pollinator relationships. Okay, we're, we're being flexible. So, um, there are already, there's already a lot of existing pollinator information, um, as you may know. And so, um, this data has been collected for many, for many different purposes. So, um, there's the Interaction Web Database, which um, compiles academic studies of um, all sorts of interactions, but many of these are plant pollinator interactions. There's obviously natural history records, um, including the pollinator library, um, voucher field specimens. Um, the USGS has a big collection of this. And also, um, in order to build pollinator gardens for public outreach and conservation, um, planting guides have been compiled by groups like Pollinator um, Partnership. But um, many of these resources are obviously um, have very few rare plant observations because, as you may um, figure mathematically, most of the plant pollinator interactions happen between um, common plants and pollinators. So, what's really what's still needed is a resource that focuses on endangered plants. So, um, the Center for Plant Conservation got a grant from the Fish and, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to add pollinator information to our existing um, database of um, rare and endangered plant species called the CBC National Collection. And so the CBC National Collection is um, over a thousand species um, that are held in conservation ex situ collections across our network of botanical institutions. And so the information on these um, profiles contains a lot of um, important botanical and also conservation um, research that's been done um, on these species over the years. So pollinator information would be a natural, um, find a natural home on this resource. And so how do we compile pollinator information about endangered species um, in the National Collection? So um, my colleague, Joe Davitt, who many of you may know from the Sea Bank at the San Diego Zoo, actually um, went down the list of National Collection species and was able to find 400 papers of primary literature about um, the pollinators of rare plants. But um, we felt that this wasn't quite comprehensive enough, so we expanded our literature out to the gray literature, including government reports, photos, um, blogs. We decided to be inclusive in this case because um, there's so little known about many of these species that we thought um, we would leave it to the user to decide what is um, what information they trust and what information is useful to them. And so um, in this process of cataloging gray literature, we've logged over 150 volu 1,500 volunteer hours from the San Diego Zoo Volunteer Program, which is always an amazing resource for us. And so um, we still are missing um, some endangered plants. Um, so we use some of these existing um, um, bulk databases to supplement um, species at the genus level so that at least um, one plant in the genus of every rare plant in the national collection was represented. So um, in the end, our pollinator database includes both um, rare and endangered, or rare and common plants, but with a focus on rare plants. And so um, we compiled this database. Um, it, the first iteration was finished around um, 2018. And um, you can find it both on the National Collection Profiles, as I talked about, and also a pollinator-specific interface at saveplants.org slash pollinators. 
And so, um, not that I was working on this talk last night, but I decided a great example to use is a species that was um, presented on yesterday, Lestinia burkii. So what you can do is um, search for the pollinators of an endangered plant, as one uses search, and then it returns um, a list of pollinators that are organized by um, main pollinator types. Um, here we see both bees and flies, um, and then it kind of cascades in with specificity. And so um, we also try to qualify what kind of relationship it was in the database, whether it was a confirmed pollination or a floral visit or not specified. Um, and then we also have the reference in text and a link to the primary reference. And if you go even further into the view details, the real nitty gritty, um, it may also say if it's a primary or secondary source and um, where the, um, the text that referenced the pollination event. So um, you can download this um, for your purposes. It's freely available and open to the public. Um, and you can also search for the pollinators, or wait, plants of pollinators. Um, so here's a rare pollinator. Um, according to the internet, I don't really know. Don't, don't at me. Um, and so um, this is Bombus crachii, and if you search for it, you can find that it um, is recorded as having visited to um, rare plants. Um, the Cranesthesia and Chloropyron, which is kind of interesting. All right. And so um, that's in general an overview of the resource, but um, we also wanted to think about a way to extend this data so that it could be more useful to conservation. And so um, I had a San Diego Zoo Summer um, intern, Kara Powell, who was an undergraduate at UCSD. Um, she created a web app in the platform RShiny to um, kind of um, have data visualization tools and data science tools that could be um, extending and building upon this database. And so um, this is a platform that's really great for ecologists like me who program a lot in R but maybe aren't great web developers. Um, so I would really recommend um, kind of having some fun with this tool. So the first um, tool that Kara made was um, the Comet Pollinator Garden um, Finder. So the idea behind this was that um, maybe if you're looking at um, over a plant site and um, you want to know if the pollinators will be present, um, if it's suitable habitat and the pollinators will be there for this plant, you could um, try to assess if that site is potentially um, suitable by looking at if other plants that share that pollinator are present. So again, we can put in less than a Berkeley and we can see what um, the plants that share the most pollinators with it are. And um, Lemnos from a baker guy comes up. Hopefully that occurs in the same general region. I know Desia multicalis doesn't, but um, it, this is kind of a conceptual idea, but um, it's um, a way that we might be able to use big pollinator data to inform our conservation priorities. Um, and then she also made a really fun network vi visualization. Obviously these aren't true pollinator networks, it's from the literature, but you can still see um, the guilds that are associated with the focal plant. Here it's a Bronia mafala, and you can see it has um, three different kinds of main pollinator groups. The purple, I believe, are butterflies. The pink are moths, and the yellow are bees. And then it takes out one degree of separation, so you can see all the plants that are associated with those pollinators. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of a fun tool. On the actual app, you can like um, pull around the, the points and um, really just like make yourself dizzy, but... Um, <laughs> But what I, I, I think was also cool about this app is that Kara makes the data available. So if you have real pollinator networks, you could also use this um, code to visualize your data this way if you haven't already. And then the last thing I'll say about how this data could potentially be used is um, for phylogenetic analysis. Obviously, um, since they're not real networks, that's a hard, harder analysis to do, but it could be used to establish presence of um, plants on a phylogeny, not necessarily absence, but um, we have an app where you can view the, um, the distribution of a specific um, pollinator on the tree, um, on a tree of the plant families in the database. And this heat map here shows um, the proportion of observations in a family in each main pollinator group. And so obviously these are pretty popular pollinators. Yeah, and so some challenges with this database, um, I kind of mentioned as I went along, um, it's, it's at the literature level, so it's not necessarily for network um, 
analysis. And also, there's variable specificity within this database. Um, we want it to be as inclusive as possible. So some data is just bees, some might be bumblebees, some might be Bombus pennsylvanicus. Um, it just was very dependent on what was available um, with the idea that um, more information is better than no information. And so, um, as I've had some time to think about this resource and get really intimate with the pollinator of bird plants literature, um, it became really apparent to me that um, there's a lot more work that we could be done on aggregating existing information. I'm sure if I took all the rare plant pollinator information in this room and sucked it into the database, it would increase a lot. But I think also there's a great deal of just we don't know and nobody knows information about rare plant pollinators. So um, I'm going to use this as like a shameless plug of um, a second project I want to talk to you guys about, which is CPC Rare Plant Academy, which is a conservation training tool that um, CPC has an IMLS grant um, to build. And so this tool it really builds upon the best practice guidelines that CPC has developed over the years. Um, there's a print version that's available freely as a PDF online, and um, also it's available in HTML form on CBC, or, or Bird Plant Academy, academy.cbplants.org. Um, this also has a forum, which you should pay special attention to this question and maybe answer it for me, um, because we're having a lot of problems um, growing the kind of stegia or cadiana. Um, but the idea behind this is that um, Professionals can learn from each other and share discourse about um, rare plant curation questions. But really, what I want to talk to you guys about is um, the funding we have to produce educational videos. So right now, a lot of the videos on this um, platform are conference proceedings. Um, I really wish that maybe I would have thought to coordinate recording this conference because it has so much amazing conservation information. But um, we have several other, um, or maybe you guys are recording this. Um, yeah, oh my gosh. I'm so sorry, I'm so dense, and now I'm embarrassed. Um, but what I really want you guys to do is think about produced videos. So we're um, making an increasing number of produced videos um, on the roulette, right? Um, there's um, an animation that was made by our collaborators in Hawaii about how to do a plant reintroduction with volunteers, and on the left is um, Lisa Hill from the USDA National Laboratory for um, Genetic Resources Preservation, showing people how to dry down seeds using salt solution. So it's a broad, a broad variety of topics, but um, all related to plant conservation methods. And so if you guys want to be internet famous, um, we're um, funding $1,000 for a 250-word storyboard with the components that could be edited to, together to make a video, which could be still um, images or um, videos, um, preferably with some humans talking. Um, and we can provide the editing, voiceover, and storyboard consultation if you guys need. And um, priority topics that fit within the best practices guidelines could be um, definitely some related to pollinators. A great one would be how to determine how pollinator, um, sorry, if a site has pollinators necessary for reintroduction in the end, or any plant conservation topic that you get asked all the time that you just want to send people over to and be done with. So, yeah, let me know if you have any questions and contact me if you have any inquiries about pollinator data that I should upload or videos you want to produce.